Okay, so good morning everyone and welcome back to traditional China. It looks like everyone has made it to the new room. So excellent. So just as kind of review, right? We were talking USB drives work a lot better when you plug them in. Fun fact, pro tip. There we go. So remember our objectives here is we're, we're kind of trying to understand the roots of Chinese political thought and culture and so forth. Um, so in particular, we need to, if we want to understand China, we need to understand the obstacles to Chinese unity, how those obstacles were overcome, and then also that leads to a certain kind of politics, a certain kind of society, so we need to understand those characteristics, and then we will start tracing the history of the rise of the Ming Dynasty. So one thing we talked about last time, and this is what I mean about obstacles to unity, China is like the size of Europe, right? China is the size of Europe, but Europe is made up of you know, more than a dozen countries China is China. It's like one country. So how does that work, right? And I, I gave you an example, and, and I'm sorry, that comparison is meant to highlight the problem, right? How do, why is it, or the question, why is it that China is able to unify whereas Europe doesn't, right? Even the Roman Empire never gets Northern Europe, for example. One issue, of course, we talked about last time were communication problems, right? Remember, the emperor can't be everywhere at once, and how do you govern territory when it takes weeks or even months to send a message to that territory? Right? For example, if you study like English history, like in the 9th, 10th, 11th centuries, the kings moved around a lot right, in order to govern. The king had to be there to govern. The Chinese emperor can't do that. Right? So how does that work? We also talked about how China can be divided up into macro regions. Just like Europe has many, many potential countries in it, right? countries that could exist on their own with their own governments, China also does, right? These macro regions, these are areas where there's enough people, enough agriculture, enough commerce that you could theoretically have another country. So how does that work, right? Uh, there's always this kind of push then for division because of that. We also talked about how China has immense geographic diversity. How do you rule a country that has all these big rivers or all these mountains or deserts or jungle? Right? That terrain makes it hard to communicate, makes it hard to unify through simple force. Right? It's hard to march armies through the desert. It's hard to march them over mountains. But also, this geographic diversity impacts food. Right? And in China, there's kind of a rice belt. This is the area where you have enough water and where it's warm enough for rice agriculture to work. Up here, you can't really grow rice well. It's just like, this is kind of like Indiana, the Midwest, Nebraska. Rice doesn't grow well there. We, Corn grows well up here. And then you've got this kind of mixed area in the middle. Now you may ask, why would that be an obstacle to, towards unity? Well, it's because it produces different cultures. Right? It produces different cultures. So again, when you think of the United States, especially places like Indiana or Nebraska, of course South Carolina, you think of these kind of independent farmers. Right? People who lived on their land and maybe their nearest neighbor was a mile away. That works with wheat farms because of the amount of acreage it takes to support people. Right? Wheat takes, if you want to have a, a big enough farm to support you, you need several dozen acres at least, ideally several hundred acres if you can do it. So it takes a lot of land. People tend to live independently. But in areas where there's rice growing, because of the nature of rice, it doesn't, first of all, you don't need much land. Rice is extremely productive. It takes very little land to, to grow enough rice to support people. So people tend to live more densely. They tend to live in smaller, or I'm sorry, in the small villages or even large villages because you don't need that much land. You don't have to spread out. And when you can be together, you know, that gives you extra protection from invaders and things like that. But also what's complicated about rice farming is there's certain times that the rice has to be wet. There's certain times it has to be dry and you have to like move it into different fields and you have to drain the water at certain times. And if you do it wrong, you hurt your neighbor. Right? So if I drain my field too early, I could flood my neighbor and kill his crops. But the problem is, you know, I need to get my work done quickly so we can drain my field so you can get the water or whatever. So we work together a lot of the times. So you have people who might be on different, not even family members, working on the same farm. Today we're going to do your farm, tomorrow we're going to do my farm because that's just the way we have to do the drainage. So areas that are more rice agriculture tend to be more group oriented, right? The idea, the American farmer ideal is like a rugged individual, right? 
in southern China, and, and I'm sorry, and that works for northern China. Southern China, no. It's much more group oriented because of this rice agriculture. That creates different cultures. So it's very easy to have cultural division in China. And in some of the videos we'll see sometimes like the people, you know, um, and David, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think sometimes people in the south, right, people in the north, sometimes they see the world very differently. Right? Northern China, I think, is more political, more kind of independent. Southern China, more oriented towards trade, right? Merch making money. Yeah, yeah. Southern, yeah, 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 right. Southern Chinese are really good at making money. Right? That's kind of the idea. Northern Chinese are really good at politics. That's kind of the stereotype. Yeah. But there's some truth to it, too. So there's, and so my key point I want to highlight here was all this can lead to different cultures, to different ways of seeing the world, and that could easily lead to division. So that's another re why, reason why we have to really understand this problem to understand how remarkable China is, because there's all these forces that encourage division. There is also the problem of language, right? So for example, how many people have seen a Jackie Chan movie? Most of you have, right? What language are they speaking? But which Chinese? Cantonese, usually. Cantonese. There's different dialects, and Chinese people don't necessarily understand each other's dialects. Right? So if you take a Mandarin speaker, and they watch a Jackie Chan movie, they may not understand at all what's going on. And in the Hong Kong protests, this actually became a big deal, because when there was some, some kind of conflict, they were trying to figure out where people were from. They said, oh, those people that, that beat us up, uh, they did not have Cantonese accents. They spoke like with a, with a northern accent, so we don't know where they're from. They're not from Hong Kong. Right? But the key thing is you have in China a multiple different languages. Right? We've talked about, uh, there's a student who's very famous, Chinese student, very famous in Lander now. You heard us talk about it earlier. She's from Shanghai, and they have their own dialect that's different from Mandarin. So you have language differences, and Chinese dialects can be as different as, say, French and Italian. So if you're a Mandarin speaker, you don't know necessarily what a Cantonese speaker is saying. Right? You know Chinese is famous for tones, right? Like when Chinese people talk, it goes up and down. There's these different tones like ma, ma, ma. I, my Chinese is really bad, David. I'm sorry, but that's the idea. Mandarin has four of those, like an up sound, a down sound, a flat sound, and then a, I think, up, down. Cantonese has eight. So it's a very different kind of spoken language. So how do you hold a country together when the people can't talk to each other? Right? And now, all Chinese people speak Mandarin. They may speak another language. But in this time period, no. Most Chinese people did not speak Mandarin. Usually when people say they speak Chinese, what they mean is, I speak Mandarin. That's, we'll talk more about Mandarin later. But there's all these different languages. And one thing, if you know a second language, you know that language impacts how you think. Different languages make different cultures. Right? Different languages make different cultures. Um, so we want to think about that. China is also surrounded by powerful neighbors. The last dynasty of China, for example, was not ruled by Han Chinese. Han are the majority ethnic group. 95% of Chinese people are Han. The last Chinese dynasty was ruled by a group of people called Manchus, who came in and conquered China. China was also conquered by the Mongols. China has powerful neighbors that can come in and conquer it. And you may say, well, powerful neighbors that threaten you, can't that unify you? Yeah, it can. But if you get conquered by them, <laughs> it's not a unifying force anymore. Especially if they only conquer part of the country. Right? They only conquer part of the country. So China was surrounded by powerful neighbors like the Mongols and by these northern people who sometimes would conquer all or part of China. So to give you a couple examples, um, this is a map of China, what's called the Spring and Autumn period, the Warring States period. This is this is like 260 BC, so this is very old. This is around the time Confucius was alive. But China was divided into multiple different states. It was unified, but it didn't have to unify, right? But it came in Chinese history to be understood that this is weird, that this is abnormal, that to be unified is normal. But it, there were periods, sometimes lasting centuries, in which China was not unified. Right? There would be periods, sometimes lasting centuries, in which China was not unified. And here's an example right, where people from the north came in, took over the northern part of China, and you had a divided China that could last hundreds of years. And yet, even after being divided for hundreds of years, China would come back together again. So I think that's really interesting, right? 
The Roman Empire was unified for a long time, but no one ever succeeded in rebuilding it. But China has been divided multiple times, been conquered multiple times, and it always got put back together again. Right? Always got put back together again. So now we've kind of talked about what I think are the chief obstacles uh, to unity. We need, our, we need to now talk about, well, how to get unified. We identified the problem, the reasons for the problem. Right? The problem is, why is it, the, the problem is division. What are the causes of that, possible causes of division? Now we need to understand why China was able to hold together. Key, I think, is the written language. Right? The way the Chinese works. Right, the way the Chinese works as a written language. Now, I'm glad that, especially for, uh, I'm glad, of course, that David and Aiko were able to join us, and of course, Dr. Hessen, all of you, but specific, specifically now I'm going to pick on Aiko and David, because I want to illustrate something to you about how Chinese works. Now, you know, even if you don't know Chinese, what these characters mean, because they've got the symbol by it. Right? You know that this means sun, this means eye, this means tree, this means mountain. Right? Very simple. You can understand that even if you don't know Chinese. But let me show you something that's kind of, um, but you know, let's see. My Spanish isn't very good, but I think isn't soul is Spanish for sun, isn't it? Right. Okay, excellent. So sun, soul, you wouldn't necessarily know that those words are connected, right? The pronunciation is different. The spelling is different. So that's something you want to think about. In English and Spanish, the pronunciation of the word and the meaning of the word are tied together. Right? English and Spanish and most Western languages Pronunciation of the word, meaning of the word, are connected. All right, so let's do an experiment here. We already identified this means sun. David, how do you pronounce this in Chinese, please? Uh, er? Uh, uh, I can't get it. But Eiko? Taiyo. Very different. Right? If you don't know Eiko, Eiko is Japanese. So she's giving us the Japanese pronunciation of this character. If you're Korean, this is il. Very different. All right, let's do another one. David? Mu. Mu. Echo? Me. Me. It's similar, like soul and sun, but you wouldn't necessarily know it until someone pronounces it. Of course, Kore Koreans pronounce this book. Right? I'm representing Korea. <laughs> uh, all right, let's finish it off. Mu. Mu. Echo? Ki. Ki. Very different. Korean's kind of a blend. Uh, he said mu, ki. Koreans say mo. Same. It's the same pronunciation in Korean. <laughs> all right. Shan. Shan. Yama. Yama. Right? Uh, if you heard the name like Yamaguchi or something like that, it's like Mr. What is it? It's like Mountain Mouth. I think Yamaguchi, I think it's like, it'd be like Mountain Pass. Uh, Korean San. So you can see there's some similarity, but here's the key. But there's enough difference that, you know, you wouldn't necessarily, if you just spoke it, you wouldn't know what was the, the meaning. But the writing, it doesn't matter. This is what's key. It doesn't matter how you pronounce these things. The written style is the same. So whereas English and Spanish, we identify sun, tree, with sounds that mean something, so we can't understand each other spoken or written unless we know each other's language. Chinese doesn't work that way. In Chinese, the pronunciation is independent of the meaning. Right? So that's why it doesn't matter that Chinese people spoke different languages because they wrote the same language. The pronunciation doesn't matter. What matters is how it's written. And the reason why, especially, you can see China's influence. These are what we call Chinese characters. Koreans and Japanese use them traditionally as well. And what was fun is if Chinese and Japanese and Korean people met, they could talk to each other. They would text message, basically. They would write notes to each other. Uh, I specialize in Korea, and what's really interesting is, in the, uh, and I focus on religion, the first Koreans that became Catholics went up to China to see priests so they could confess their sins, right? In, in Catholicism, you're supposed to confess your sins. But the Western priests or the Chinese priests didn't speak Korean. So the Koreans wrote down their sins, gave it to the priest, the priest read it, and then wrote back what they should do. And then afterwards, they washed off the ink so no one would know their sins. But the key thing I want to stress is this means that Chinese ideas are able to spread very easily. You don't have to speak the language. You can read it. It doesn't matter how you pronounce it. It all means the same thing when it's written. And that allows Chinese not only to unify their own country, but have a big influence on Korea and Japan as well. And what's important also is not simply that you have writing, but what is being written. 
It's not important simply what it is that you have writing. The question is what is being written. Uh, this is a guy that I just really admire. One thing I, I love about Chinese culture is that they loved historians. Right? So the earliest writings of, Kore of Chinese were by historians, writing down uh, the history of China, basically. This is a very famous one, Shima Chan. Right? David, could, was my pronunciation good enough? Do you know who I am? Oh, no, this isn't. Is this Kunza? Uh, no. No, this is Shima Chan. At least, well, according to Google, this is Shima Chan. <laughs> this is a picture. Now, uh, Master Kung is later. My, my, I'll, I'll give you the characters later. But this is, this is a great Chinese historian writing during what's called the Han Dynasty, which lasted from about 200 BC to 200 AD. And for Chinese, it's considered kind of the ideal dynasty. But he wrote a history during the Han Dynasty about China. So when Chinese are writing stuff, they're writing things like history. You can kind of think about this way. Most of you are Americans. When you study American history, there's a sense this is our history. This is who I am. Well, the Chinese are doing that too. They're writing the history of China. And in that history, this is weird. This is wrong. Their history is a history of unification that presents division as wrong. So in these history books, they're talking about the history of this thing called China. And this thing called China is supposed to be unified. So it gives Chinese people a sense of identity. Right? We're the Chinese people. We should be in a single, unified country. And one thing I should point out, when Japanese people first got Chinese characters, one of the first things they did was write a history about how they were not Chinese and how awesome they were. So it's interesting, Japanese people borrowed Chinese characters to write a book about how awesome they were and how they were different from China. Right, the Kojiki, I think. It's the, it was the Nihon Shogi? Uh, there's Kojiki and then there's... Kojiki, I'd say. That's the that's big one, okay. So, they're writing things that give them a sense of their own history and their own identity. I'm going to go back to some of their ideas later, but just keep that back in mind. I'll come back to the idea, ideas shortly. But there's also infrastructure. Things like the Great Wall. The Great Wall isn't simply a wall that is meant to keep people out. Oftentimes the wall was not there to keep people out, it was there to regulate trade and things like that. But the Great Wall had a cultural function. If you live on this side, the southern half, you are Chinese. You are under the ruler of the emperor, you're part of the civilized world. If you live north of the wall, you're a barbarian, you're not Chinese. So this gave Chinese people a sense of identity. What does it mean to be Chinese? Well, we've got this shared history. Uh, we're not those barbarians. We're ruled by this emperor, who's, and the emperor rules the people south of the wall. And this infrastructure isn't just kind of, you know, this is for defense primarily. There's also other forms of infrastructure that help hold the country together and tie it together. And one thing I think that's really cool is this thing called the Grand Canal. China has really good west-east rivers, right? There's the Yellow River in the north, the Yangtze River in the south. These rivers flow west to east. So if you want to go west to east, it's really easy. And these rivers are very important. Uh, most ancient civilizations grow up along rivers. You need easy access to water. But there's no good north-south rivers. So the Chinese, being the Chinese, just said, let's build a river that connects the north and the south. It's called the Grand Canal. So they, you know, you're familiar with things like the Erie Canal with canal building. They built a canal from here all the way up to here. Now that is an impressive uh, accomplishment because not only do you have to build the darn thing, every year you have to fix it, right? You have to repair it, you have to maintain it. But this allowed, this was primarily built so they could bring taxes and grain to the north, to Beijing. But the key thing I want to stress about this here is this just ties the country together, right? So there's mental things, mental concepts, ideas of being Chinese, language that tie the country together, but there are also practical physical things. So we're going to build on this more, but I want to give you kind of a summary. Usually I don't always, I don't like to read slides, but with a material this complex, sometimes I like to have a nice little summary. So why China was able to last? I would argue that China developed a shared set of values that connected the Chinese state, culture, and I want to stress, for Chinese people, being cultured is being moral. Being polite, remember the video we watched on Monday? That's part of being virtuous. Right, so... It's, it's just really, you know how there's that saying you can't judge a book by its cover? 
That to me seems like a crazy saying, because that's how I know what's inside a book, because I read the cover. And politeness, the idea is, it tells whether you're a virtuous person or not. If you're a polite person, you consider other people. Right? That's, and much of Chinese virtue is based around being a good member of a group. Being polite, respecting other people, is necessary to be part of a group. So when I talk about culture here, we're taught, because we're a multicultural society, to respect other cultures, to see them as all kind of equal. But in China, in this time period, no. Culture, morality, civilization, they're all the same. Right? They're all the same. And also, this, as we'll talk about more later, this is connected to the cosmos. Chinese culture is cosmically right. right? And I mean on like a transcendent level, like on a religious level. We'll come back a little bit more to it, but not, I just talked about the physical things. Mentally, this is kind of what's holding this country together. And even though physical things like infrastructure help, what holds a country together is, in a sense, the concept of a country. As long as there's ch people who think that they're Chinese, who believe that it's right for there to be a China, China will exist. Right? It will continue to exist. Countries, in a sense, identities exist in our heads to a large degree. It doesn't mean they're not real. They are real but they're these kind of mental concepts. Okay, we'll come back a little bit, continue with that later. I wanna give you a few announcements. So if you register for this class but did not attend Monday, please see me after class, I have some handouts. We might start section two on Friday, as you know from modern Japan, if you were in that class. I am eternally optimistic. We may not, but we might. So we might start section two on Friday. So if you wanna bring the PowerPoints study guide, I'd encourage you to do so. So there's a syllabus quiz due by Sunday. I apologize that last time I had kind of a uh, mental lapse, but we do have a syllabus quiz. I double check there is a syllabus quiz up there. That's due by Sunday. Remember, that's the one you can take as many times as you want so you get them all right. So do that. Please make sure you get all the points. The review quiz will open Friday after class and close at 11.59 p.m. Sunday. Remember, because the review quiz covers what went over during the week. So I don't want you taking the quiz before Friday because we haven't covered all the material that could be on the quiz. The reading quiz will open today and close at 11.59 p.m. Sunday. Right, so reading quizzes, I'm comfortable opening early because you can do the reading early if you so choose. Now, what do I mean by reading quiz? All right, well, remember I, I gave out the reading guide on Monday. I won't always do that. I'm just doing it with the first one so you can see what it is. But basically, if you were to go to our Blackboard page, you'd see this folder, readings and reading quizzes. If you go into that folder, you can see reading quiz one, reading quiz two, reading quiz three. So everything you need for the reading quiz should be in its respective folder. And there you would see it says, Reading Quiz 1, Reading Guide. That's the thing I gave you. Right? That's the thing I gave you. You get on there, you can save it again, so you can type notes into it if you want, but that's identical. That is the file for what I gave you. Then it says, Reading Quiz 1, Readings. I know that's terrible English, but I want to be clear. Um, part 1, Making of Modern China, Part 1. Right? That's really confusing because there's three parts to the Making of Modern China. I said Part 1 there because that's the first one. Basically, just read these in order. Right? They're in chronological order. This first one is a comic, right? It's interesting, it's written by a Chinese artist telling Chinese history. Um, again, for my pe people who took the, who've taken classes before, I love comics. I study really depressing stuff, so I like to include comics because they cheer me up. Right, so, and also they're good ways to learn history. Right? So that first one is a comic. The second one is really hard, right? The second one, the appendix, there's a book called 1587, A Year of No Significance. Wonderful book, highly recommend it. There's like a four-page reading from the appendix there, which is at the back of the book. That is a difficult reading. That's one reason I want to talk about it. It is a conversation between a Chinese emperor, uh, the Wanli emperor. Uh, I know my friend. Did, was that good enough? Could you understand uh, the emperor? Wanli? Well, I'm not. Okay. One of the last Ming emperors. Sorry, my friend. So this is probably Korean and Japanese. I'm fine. Chinese, sometimes my pronunciation is not good enough. Um, he's one of the last Ming emperors. And this is a conversation between him and his ministers, like his high officials. And it's like the most passive aggressive thing ever. Right? And so I want you to read it so you can see how Chinese government works. Because it's this really kind of bizarre reading. And I have readings, that's why I had the reading guide, to help you understand what I'm looking for. Because you read it, it's going to be confusing, it's all get out. So just look at the questions beforehand, read it carefully, know that it's supposed to be confusing. Right? All right? It's not supposed to be confusing, but know that it is confusing. It's not you, it is confusing. I say because it's passive aggressive is all get out. Reading quiz three, or this next reading, that's the another part of the comic. That's another part of the comic. And then 
this is my view, so it's already showing, but this then should show up later. There's the quiz. So everything that you need for reading quiz one is in there. The study guide, which I already gave you, but if you want electronic copy and get it, all the readings, and then the reading quiz. So any questions there? Okay, and I usually will talk a little bit about the readings before the reading quiz because sometimes the readings are quite challenging. Okay, so when I talked about concepts, right, all this stuff that hold together, one of the most important of those concepts is what's called, what I call, the Chinese imperial system. Now, one thing I want to stress, in Chinese history, we divide things up by dynasties. Until the last dynasty, it falls in like 1911. But for like 5,000 years, which is how long Chinese people claim to have a history, um, they have dynasties. A dynasty is the imperial ruling family. When the family changes, the dynasty changes. Right? So when I say, we've got this dynasty, we've got that dynasty, there's a change in the ruling family. So I just want to stress that first of all. Now, what Chinese people believe was that heaven, and heaven is kind of like God. I mean, for this class, this isn't a religion class, but it's kind of like God. But heaven doesn't really care whether you worship heaven or not that much. Heaven cares that you be respectful to other human beings. Right? That's what heaven is focused on. Heaven does not get angry so much if you, if you don't worship heaven. It does get angry if you're not nice to other people. So that's, that's a little bit different from, say, the Christian or Jewish concepts of God. But it was believed that heaven, because heaven is benevolent, heaven cares about human beings, chooses the most moral family to rule China. Right? Heaven chooses the most moral family to rule China. And this is a group-oriented society. They don't just pick individuals. Heaven chooses the family. Right? So the emperor, that's the emperor. He has kids, they become emperors, then they become emperors, then they become emperors. Do you want me to give for history 375? Uh, journalism. Yeah, I'm sorry, they moved. Oh, Here, okay. Here's the, it's been moved to LC 300. So it's just back that way and up. Okay. Okay. So, um, and the emperor was referred to as the son of heaven. Right? And is the mediator between heaven and earth. Right? So the emperor is this person who kind of represents all of humanity to heaven. Right? So that's what I mean when I say the cosmos is connected to the Chinese state. China is not like other countries. The Chinese call their country the middle kingdom. They don't mean medium kingdom. They mean center of everything. China is not just the center of the world, in a sense. China is the center of the whole cosmos right? because, of this, because of the emperor. Right, the, the China has an emperor who is understood as this intermediary between heaven and earth. So the Chinese emperor has political and religious roles. The Chinese emperor does not just, for example, decide about laws, but the Chinese emperor would do things like offer sacrifice to heaven. And this is an altar of heaven, the altar of heaven. Only the emperor or his deputy was supposed to worship heaven in this way. And the emperor would offer, would like burn meat and vegetables, and then the smoke would go up to heaven. That's why there's no roof. Right? You want the sacrifice to get up to heaven. But that is the emperor's prerogative. So the emperor has political and religious duties. As an aside, for those of you who took my Japanese history class, remember in Japan they split it into two parts. Right? In Japan they had a political ruler of the shogun, a religious ruler of the emperor. In China, there's one, the emperor, political religious ruler. So like I said, then China is cosmically right. right? There's something fundamentally right about China. These are the characters for Mandate of Heaven. This is heaven. It's a person standing under the sky. Right? It's a person with their arms outstretched and the sky's over them. And this means command. Now, as long as the emperor performs his moral and ritual duty correctly, everything is okay. Now, you may say, well, how do you know if everything is okay? Chinese people were very practical. How do we know everything's okay? Are the, do the people have enough food to eat? Do the people have enough clothes to wear? Do the people have a safe place to live? Are the people safe? If the answer to all four of those questions is yes, the emperor is doing a good job. Right? The food to eat, clothes to wear, place to live, are they safe? The emperor's doing that, the emperor's doing a good job, has the mandate of heaven. If the answers start being no, that's not good. But remember, heaven is benevolent. So heaven will give us a sign will give the emperor a warning. Remember also, the emperor has a relationship with heaven. 
So when things are weird, that means that maybe the emperor has lost the mandate of heaven. So let me give you an example. Last year, remember, there was that eclipse. We know what causes eclipses, but even if we know what causes eclipses, it's still kind of freaky, right? You're out there in the middle of the day and it turns dark. It's weird. Now imagine people who don't understand science, that don't understand what causes eclipses. In China, if an emperor could predict an eclipse, and the emperor had lots of astronomers to help him do this, if the emperor could predict the eclipse, people would say, ah, the emperor has the mandate of heaven. He is in harmony with the cosmos, everything is fine. The emperor fails to predict the eclipse, that's really freaky. Imagine you're out there working on your farm, and all of a sudden, the sun goes out. That's freaky. And the emperor did predict it. Something's wrong. So heaven would send warnings. That's how they would interpret a comet or an eclipse or something like that. They would say, this is heaven's warning to the emperor to do a better job. What happens if the emperor does not reform? You can overthrow the emperor and establish a new dynasty. So China had a system for getting rid of bad dynasties. Right? Emperor, the heaven can choose someone else. The mandate of heaven is not absolute. You can lose it. When you lose it, someone else can overthrow you, then they get the mandate of heaven. Now you may say, how does this work, right? Well, if you succeed in overthrowing the previous dynasty, then you must have received the mandate of heaven. Otherwise, how could you succeed in overthrowing the dynasty? Right? How do we know that you have the mandate of heaven? If your rebellion works. It can only work if heaven helped you. And it's backwards logic, but that's how it was understood. You can only be successful with heaven's help. Okay, now I've taught for a while, and uh, if you haven't taken my class before, I think it's important to break that up. So I like to show like a video clip or something, but it's not for fun, right? It's meant to highlight something. So I want to play a clip for you that introduces this guy, Confucius. I love Confucius. I think the guy is awesome. Uh, but I want to give an uh, opportunity for, um, to get a, a deeper glimpse into him. So I'm going to play a clip for you that introduces Confucius, talks about how his ideas might apply to today. As you watch this, I want you to catch, how might this help you govern? Right? That's the question I'll ask all of you. How are, how are Confucius' uh, teachings, as explained this clip, how might that help you govern? We know very little for certain about the life of the Chinese philosopher Confucius. He's said to have been born in 551 BC in China. He may have been a student of the Taoist master Lao Tzu. According to tradition, he began government service and served many roles, including the Minister of Crime under Duke Ding in the state of Lu. However, Confucius and the Duke fell out after the Duke received a present from a neighboring ruler, 80 beautiful women and 124 horses. The Duke spent all his time riding horses and being entertained by the women, which Confucius found deeply improper for a ruler. So he left the court and wandered for years. Around between the 3rd and 5th century BC, Confucius's works were collected into the Analects, a collection of sayings written down by his followers. Some of the morals Confucius taught are easily recognizable, most notably his version of the Golden Rule, do not do unto others what you don't want done to yourself. But some of them also sound very strange or old-fashioned to modern ears, especially to Western ones. But we need his advice all the more for this. It serves as an antidote to the troubles we currently face. Here are a few examples of what Confucius helps us to remember. 1. Ceremony is important. The Analects are filled with strange conversations between Confucius and his disciples, like this one. Tse Kung wished to do away with the offering of a sheep. Confucius said, Tse, you love the sheep, I love the ceremony. At first this is baffling, if not also humorous. Why not save the sheep? But Confucius is reminding Tse and us about the importance of ceremony. In the modern world, we tend to shun ceremony and see this as a good thing, a sign of intimacy or a lack of pretension. But Confucius believed in the value of ceremonies over sheep because he valued what he called ritual propriety. This might seem a very outdated and conservative idea, but in fact many of us have longed for particular rituals. That meal mum cooked for us whenever we were sick, or the yearly birthday outing, or our wedding vows. We understand that certain premeditated, deliberate and precise gestures stir our emotions deeply. Rituals make our intentions clear, and they help us to understand how to behave. 2. We should treat our parents with reverence. In particular, Confucius had a very strict idea about how we should behave towards our parents. He believed that we should obey them when we're young, care for them when they're old, mourn at length when they die, and make huge sacrifices in their memory thereafter. He even said that we shouldn't travel far away while our parents are alive, and should come for them if they steal a sheep. This attitude is known as filial piety. 
This sounds strange now, when many of us leave our parents' home as teenagers and rarely return to visit. We may even see them as strangers, arbitrarily thrust upon us by fate. After all, our parents are so out of touch, so pitifully human in their shortcomings, so difficult, so judgmental, and they're such bad taste in music. Yet Confucius recognized that in many ways, moral life begins in the family. We cannot truly be caring, wise, grateful, and conscientious unless we remember Mum's birthday and meet Dad for lunch. Three, we should be obedient to honorable people. Modern society is very egalitarian. We believe that we're all born equal and should ultimately be able to say and do whatever we like. We reject many rigid hierarchical roles. Yet Confucius told his followers, let the ruler be a ruler, the subject a subject, a father a father, and a son a son. This might sound jarring, but it is in fact important to realize that there are people worthy of our deep veneration, even our simple and humble obedience. We need to be modest enough to recognize the people whose experience or accomplishments outweigh our own. We should also practice peaceably doing what these people need, ask, or command. Confucius explained, The relation between superiors and inferiors is like that between the wind and the grass. The grass must bend when the wind blows across it. Bending gracefully is in fact not a sign of weakness, but a gesture of humility and respect. 4. Cultivated knowledge can be more important than creativity. Modern culture places a lot of emphasis on creativity, unique insights that come to us suddenly. But Confucius was adamant about the importance of the universal wisdom that comes from years of hard work and reflection. He listed benevolence, ritual propriety, righteousness, wisdom, integrity as the five constant virtues. While Confucius believed that people were inherently good, he also saw that virtues like these must be constantly cultivated, just like plants in a garden. He spoke about moral character and wisdom as the work of a lifetime. We can see now why he had such reverence for his elders. Of course, a burst of inspiration may well be what we need to start our business or redo our rough draft or reinvent our life. But if we're being very honest with ourselves, we'll have to admit that we also need to devote more energy to slowly changing our habits. This, more than anything else, is what prevents us from becoming truly intelligent, accomplished, and wise. Confucius died without reforming the decadent duke and his officials. But after his death, his followers created schools and temples in his honor across East Asia passing his teachings along for over 2,000 years. Today, millions of people still follow Confucius' teachings as a spiritual or religious discipline, and his thought has been a huge influence on Eastern political ideas about morality, obedience, and good leadership. We might find Confucian virtues a bit strange, or but this is what ultimately makes them all the more important. We need them as a corrective to our own excesses. The modern world is almost surprisingly totally unconfucian, informal, egalitarian, and full of innovation. So we're conversely at risk of becoming impulsive, irreverent, and thoughtless without a little advice from Confucius about good behavior and sheep. Very quickly, the uh, sheep story. He was asked, like, you know, if your dad steals a sheep, what should you do? And uh, he gives this very cryptic answer. I don't actually remember what the, his direct answer was, but it was, it was basically a non-answer. But it implied that the reason that um, this father had stolen a sheep was because his son was not taking proper care of him. And the son was a better son, the father never would have stolen the sheep. So you're wrong to be blaming the father, blame the son. That's Confucianism, <laughs> right, I think. But how would this help you govern? The focus on ceremony keeps the, the mandate of heaven and all the right? cultural, uh, moral aspects of mm -hmm. very united. Yeah. We, if, these ceremonies, they give deep into who you are, right? And they can really shape your behavior especially when you conduct them over and over again. Remember we, we saw in that video we watched last time, the kids bowing to their teacher. Right? Imagine in some places, when I would walk in the room, you would all stand up right, and bow, or there would be a formal dismissal. Right? That is a ritual. If you keep going through that, you understand that's the proper way to behave. Right? And what I want to stress, notice how hierarchical Confucianism is. All this stuff is about respecting your parents, and there's rituals. You should get up in the morning, bow to your parents. Right? You should greet them in the morning. Right? And so what happens is these become, you do these constantly, you become a part of who you are. Well, you're used to obeying your parents. Isn't the emperor like your big parent? So shouldn't you also obey the emperor? So you develop a culture of respect for authority that gets deep into your heart, so you respect authority without even thinking of it. And Confucius emphasized, basically, if you have to punish people, that's because you failed somewhere. If you train people properly through ritual, you will never have to punish them. They will just automatically know how to do the right thing. And I want to give you an example. 
So this is, Korea in many ways is actually more Confucian than China, which is kind of funny to, to think about, but Korea is arguably more Confucian than China. And uh, I had an advisor when I was in Korea, and we still stay in touch, and um, he helps me out. I, he helps me, I do what he tells me to do. And it was funny because he called me once, and uh, I was in an airport, and he called me, and I was on the phone talking at the airport, and I kept doing this, which is pointless. Why am I bowing to someone on the phone? He can't see that I'm bowing. But can you see how I've been shaped? So that without thinking, this is my superior, I have to use special ways of addressing him, I have to respect him, so I kept bowing even though I was on the phone. That's kind of the idea. We train people in that way. We have this authoritarian system. And also notice that, the, um, that Confucius says, let the son be the son, the ruler be the ruler, the minister be the minister. Know your place and stay there. Right? Know your place and stay there. That encourages stability. So I want to stress, right, one thing that holds China together is not force, especially in this time period. The Chinese government could never have held itself together strictly through violence. It's ideas, right, especially the ideas. We call him Confucius. I think his Chinese refer to him as Kongzi, which means Master Kung, which I, I think I, I like saying the master. He's awesome. But he was a wandering teacher during a time of disorder. They taught about that. And he focused on trying to teach the rulers how to bring order for the good of the common people. Right? Confucius, he wasn't a believer in democracy, but he did believe that the reason you had governments was for the good of the people. Right? We saw that. How do we know if the emperor's doing a good job? Well, this is how we know. How are the people doing? And in this, and he, he emphasizes this by being moral and performing correct rituals. He did not emphasize punishment. Right? He viewed, in a sense, when you have to punish someone, he saw that as society having a problem, as the ruler having a problem, right? Ideally, people will do what they're supposed to do. Confucius thought people were inherently good. So as much as I love him, that's one thing I disagree with about. But anyway, but Confucius tend to emphasize human relationships. Confucius did not present himself as a prophet who was going to explain how we should relate to God or to heaven. His purpose was to emphasize human relationships. And so Chinese morality focuses on these human relationships and especially morality is focused on harmony. How do we get along as a group? And that's why there's all this emphasis on hierarchy, as we saw there, reinforced through ritual. Those below should obey those above, but those above should treat those below them with benevolence. So it's a two-way street, right? It's a two-way street. This is a Korean example, but this is a Confucian example, right? In Korea, uh, on New Year's Day, you go and bow to your relative, to your uh, to your parents and your grandparents, and it's called sebe. After you do that, your parents and grandparents give you sebe don, which means bow money. So you bow to them, then they give you money. That's an example of a ritual that we're talking about. It's not a bribe, but it has important symbolism. I respect my elders; they take care of me, right? So that's why I'm bowing to uh, Cho Guang Kyo Sunim, the my Korean professor, because he took good care of me, so I need to respect him and do what he tells me to do. Fortunately, he's a benevolent person. He never asked me to do too much. One other thing we have to focus on there, here, though, these teachings focus on morality, not technical knowledge. Right? Confucianism does not focus on morality. I'm sorry, does not focus on technical knowledge. It focuses on morality. We've already kind of done this, right? We've kind of connected this back to that video. Well, no, let me give you an example, right? Remember the video we watched? The music and the way the people moved, everything was very careful, it was very gentle. I think it, for me at least, it gave me a sense of the importance of dignity, right, through the music and through how people were behaving. And that's another example of what Confucius was trying to do. Through correct music, through being polite, we can build a stable social order in which everyone gets along. That was his vision. And that's what you saw on that video we watched on Monday. Well, what does this have to do with the government? Well, the emperor needs loyal officials to help him rule. Right? The emperor cannot be everywhere at once, and China is huge. So the emperor needs loyal officials to help him rule. But that leaves open the possibility of corruption. Right? The emperor's far away. How's the emperor going to know whether I embezzled some of the tax money or not? Right? Now, China's a huge place. The emperor cannot be anywhere at once. And a lot of people want to be government officials because it gives them power. Right? Whoever collects the taxes can put a little bit in their own pocket or a lot in their pocket. What can the emperor do about it? 
And the emperor's really concerned about that. Because if you have bad officials, people won't have enough food to eat. They won't have clothes to wear. They won't have a place to live. That will lead to people saying the emperor has lost the mandate of heaven. So the emperor cannot be everywhere at once. He needs honest, loyal officials who will take care of the people. Because if they don't take care of the people, the people will overthrow the emperor. That's how it works. So the Chinese solution to this, I'm oversimplifying, but I have to, was to have an exam system. Now you may say, well, how does an exam find moral people? Well, the exam is on the Confucian classics, the ideas of Confucius. And those ideas are all focused on all this stuff. Be loyal. Care about the group. Care about the uh, people. Serve the emperor. Obey authority. And the thing is, so if you want to be a government official, you have to learn that stuff. You've got to study those Confucian classics. You've got to know them so well that you can pass three exams. And you can kind of think about this way. The more, imagine that if there was a, um, imagine that if you wanted to get, become a government official, you had to learn the Bible. And so you spent all this time studying the Bible. You're going to start thinking biblically. Right? You're going to think according to those categories, those ideas. If you spend all your time studying Confucianism, you're going to think like a Confucian. Obey the emperor. Obey authority. Know my place. Do my job. Be honest. Be loyal. So the exams encourage people to accept those ideas. Right? They encourage people to accept those ideas. Now, in order to become a government official, it was not easy. You had to pass three exams. And there was a quota. So it's not like, okay, everyone who gets an A gets to be on it. No. You've got to be like the best. Right? It's very difficult. Only like one out of every thousand people, I think, who took the exams actually passed all three. But here's the thing. Even if you only passed the first exam, which was not terribly difficult, you got benefits. You could not be beaten. Right? Uh, Chinese punishment, when it did exist, was often violent. It was often physical. You could be beaten. If you passed the exams, that was not allowed. Right? And it was normal in Chinese court cases to interrogate people under torture to make sure they were telling the truth. If you pass the first exam, that doesn't happen to you. You also were exempt from certain taxes. Now, including the labor tax. In uh, traditional China, like many other countries, you had to work for the government for free for a certain amount of time. But if you passed exams, you didn't have to do that. Imagine if you could take an exam and not pay sales tax. Everyone would be studying for that exam. And you could dress in a certain way. You were allowed to wear scholars' robes. So everyone knew how smart and awesome you were. And that's very important because remember, this is a hierarchical society where you're supposed to respect wise and virtuous people. Wearing those robes says, I'm a wise and virtuous person. And also, one thing students often ask me, well, what will happen if you fail? Nothing. You just don't pass. There's no punishment for this. And one thing that's really cool about this system, and we'll talk more about this later, Theoretically, 99% of all men could take this exam. Sorry, ladies, you're excluded. Certain men are excluded as well, but only a very small number. But the vast majority of men could sit for the exams if they chose to. Now, if you're poor, you can't study for these exams. You don't have the money. But there were cases of occasionally a peasant passing the exams. What happened more often, though, was you'd have hardworking peasants who would study the exam, or I'm sorry, who would make money, the next generation would become merchants with the money they made from farming, then they would have the money to, so that their kids could study and pass the exams. So over generations, you had social mobility. So what this means is, anyone who can is studying these, for these exams. So in order to get government officials, they have these exams, but what's happening is, now everyone in China who's educated enough to read is learning about Confucianism and becoming Confucian. Right? So these, exam these things don't end up just only being about exams. They spread this ideology, these beliefs, all throughout um, and among the people. It's a good place to stop. We'll pick up with the exams again on Friday. And real quick, there was a, you can go ahead and go. When you're done, there's just a couple people I want to call. I didn't, didn't see them. Oh, maybe not. Oh, yes, Tyler. Yes. Where are you? Okay, there you are. Sorry, thank you. And Jared. Jared. Okay, thank you. I was, uh, yes, Chris. I was learning, I was watching a video about this. Um, who was the. It was late.